Kurt Signetti has jolted a whole bunch of energy into Indiana Hoosier football, but will it be enough for IU to be the surprise team in the Big Ten this season? Shannon Griffith of the Hoosier Tailgate as part of the Believe In Podcast Network joins me next to preview the 2024 Indiana Hoosiers. From L.A. to Piscataway, all Big Ten, all year long. This is Big Ten Ten. If you're looking for a candidate for a surprise team in the Big Ten in 2024, it just may be the Indiana Hoosiers. To talk all things football from Bloomington, Indiana, we welcome in Shannon Griffith, former 28-year college football coaching veteran, eight years as the quarterback coach at Ball State. Now he is the host of of the Hoosier Tailgate as part of the Believe in Podcast Network. Here is where I want to start. Kurt Signetti and this incoming coaching staff have injected an immense amount of energy into Indiana Hoosier football. Tons of excitement surrounding this program uh, right now. What's the feeling in Hoosier circles about the future starting with the 2024 season? Him and his staff have hit the ground running once they planted their feet on Indiana soil. Uh, and it's been a uh, 24-7 type of approach for them as they've, you know, had to conquer some challenges as well as start the recruiting process of the younger, you know, the 25 class. But overall, it's a definitely a optimistic excitement that you can feel. It's uh, it's very tenable. Uh uh, when you talk about it, when you hear about it, reporters talking about the, that in general. So I think overall, uh, it's all looking in a positive direction for Indiana as they enter the 24th season. Kurt did some fantastic things at James Madison University. They started, of course, FCS for the longest time. They move over to FBS uh, those last couple of years with the Dukes over there when they joined the Sun Belt Conference. Now you are bringing in a ton of James Madison personnel on the sideline and a lot of James personnel, James Madison personnel between the lines as well. A lot of players coming over. We're going to get to that when we cover offense, when we cover defense. A lot of those Dukes players coming over. How do you think that that's going to translate? Because it's a pretty big jump going from the group of five uh, to a conference like the Big Ten. Yeah, I think those are the type of questions, Marks, that still remain on some of those kids that have transferred over um, to in, in Indiana. The Pounds kid that was a freshman All-American in, in the Sun Belt, who was a coveted corner in the uh, portal uh, amongst SEC teams like Alabama and LSU and Georgia, ultimately decided to come to Indiana. Those battles weren't won in the past. Those kids did not come to Indiana, but they got a top kid in him. So I think you're correct. I mean, it is a jump. Um, some of these kids that are at those lower levels, they maybe have lacked uh, an inch or two in their size or, you know, they were questionable coming out of high school. They weren't as big and strong, but now they've had their, you know, b body of work completed at a division one level school and there's confidence in those kids from the staff. And I do think that they interject a, a positive uh, into the program because they come with a winning mindset. And that's something that Indiana has got to form in belief in they can win football games, no matter who's across from them. Whether it's Kurt Signetti's press conferences, whether it's his interviews that he's done since then, he's talked about that mindset, injecting that winning attitude into the Indiana Hoosiers football program. Now, Kurt Signetti's offenses at James Madison University, yeah, they could put up some production, yards, points, anything, anything. They are they were really explosive, no doubt about that. Uh, Mike Shanahan, not that Mike Shanahan, but Mike Shanahan also comes over as the offensive coordinator who was with Kurt Signetti uh, as well. This is a staff that has a proven track record on offense. They like to throw the football around uh, a little bit. How different do you expect this Indiana offense uh, to look like? What are the major differences between maybe what it looked like in the past and what it's going to look like now? They've got a top-notch offensive staff. I mean, he kept Bob Bobstead, who, who was the former Wisconsin offensive line coach, which I think was a huge, huge uh, rehire at Indiana because of what he's able to do. Um, 
you're looking at, I think you're going to see a multiple D offense. I don't think you're necessarily going to see, you know, the four and five wide gunslinging it all over the place. I think you'll see a team that tries to have some balance when what they do, running the football, throwing the football, taking what the defense gives you. Um, but, you know, I think mo for the most part, you're going to see uh, an offense that is going to find ways to run the ball, to have success and then utilize the passing game to complement whatever they're doing in the running game to have that def have the defense a little bit more on their heels. One thing Indiana did last year, they got too uh, into the situation where predictability entered the equation on many occasions that hurt them as an offense. I don't think you'll see the predictability with a Kurt Signetti, Mike Shanahan ran offense, which I think will better them uh, in all phases and complement what they have on offense as a, uh, as personnel. And I think they do a pretty good job utilizing their personnel and what they've got and fitting their schemes to the skill level they have on the field. Now, a lot of people were excited about Taven Jackson coming into Indiana, coming back, right? He was a local kid at high school, went to Tennessee for a year in a loaded quarterback room, and then he came back. Eventually, it became more of Brendan Sorsby's show mm -hmm. last year, and Taven, once again, slated to be the backup because Curtis Rourke transfers in from the University of Ohio, former MAC Offensive Player of the Year. Big guy, big arm. What excites you about Curtis Rourke and his talents within this offense that we were just talking about? Well, I think Kurt Signetti's philosophy as it pertains to the transfer portal is he only wants to take kids that have a body of work to be evaluated. He's not looking for the second or third teamer at Alabama, LSU, or Georgia. That's nothing against those type of kids, but he wants to be able to see what a kid has put down on film. Curtis Rourke fits all the all the all the check boxes that he looks for. Big kid, strong arm, uh, mobility. I think he's uh, a very very talented kid. Um, will he, will he struggle with the speed of the game? I doubt it. I think he'll be a guy that they can rely on, uh, heavily and Taven Jackson, a kid that you mentioned, I know a lot of people have come, you know, are down on Taven in that regard, uh, from last year's performance, but I keep reminding people, remember, he's a young kid, yeah. you know, he is not a fifth year junior or whatever in terms of his eligibility. He's still a young kid that will benefit from this type of offense learning because he actually had a really good spring. I mean, he had a really good spring. And so the competition at that quarterback position is high. Uh, that's going to make them better. But Curtis Rourke, I think, gets the nod over the fact that his productivity on, on film is a little bit better than what Taven has out right this time. But I think they've got two really solid quarterbacks heading into the Big Ten. When we talk about the optimism surrounding offense and taking that big jump, man, when you look at this receiver room, it is deep and it is talented. Of course, maybe the guy that I'm excited about the most, maybe you and a lot of other people are excited about Elijah Surratt coming over uh, from James Madison. And this was a guy that over 1,000 yards receiving last year. He was 11th in the country and receiving yards, the highest graded pro football focus transfer wide receiver in this year's transfer class. And then you bring in Miles Cross, 617 yards, five touchdowns at Ohio. How about Miles Price? We can see for miles and miles. Price comes mm -hmm. over from Texas Tech, 410 yards and five touchdowns and a big keep. Donovan McCulley from last year's team, the former quarterback, 644 yards, six touchdowns, a leading receiver for the Hoosiers. Just how deep and explosive do you think this uh, Indiana receiver room can be? Yeah, it's it, it, it has to be one of the top receiver rooms in the Big Ten uh, going into the year with what they have on paper. You talked about the Surratt kid. He's a very uh, versatile type of kid that can play in about any position, and that's kind of what they did at uh, JMU with him and moving him around and putting him in, in the best possible position. I don't know if that's a necessary thing they'll do. They may just keep him at the inside receiver in, in most of it, but he has versatility. Uh, you talked about Price. Uh, what he did at OU, uh, you've got the kid, like you said, at Texas Tech. He did. He was another kid that had a, a pretty productive year at Texas Tech. And then, of course, Donovan Colley is the one that's got to take a step forward. He's a kid on the outside that is a definite one-on-one -on -one type of wide receiver. You want out there, tall, lanky. 
does have some speed and things. And if EJ Williams can remain healthy, he's another one on the outside that can cause problems. And he showed that last year. The problem with EJ has been he has not finished anything as it pertains to seasons or practice because he has had injuries. So that's the biggest question mark on him. But overall, as a depth of the wide receiver room, if I'm the wide receiver coach, I have a big smile on my face. The only thing I have to worry about is how do I get enough reps and touches for eight guys that are legitimate guys that have the right to be on the field with the number one unit? Yeah, that's a big question is where is the distribution, yeah. right? Where is the football going in certain situations as well? Let's move to the run game, right? This was an Indiana offense or the run game that wasn't great last year. Their leading mm-hmm. rusher uh, last season was Trent Howland. He rushed for only 354 yards. But this running back room, a lot like uh, most of this roster, completely flipped. You bring in Kalen Black, another JMU kid, 668 yards rushing last year. Justice Ellison from Wake Forest, 548 yards on the ground last year. Tyson Lawton, another JMU kid, 569 yards, five scores. Him and Black were kind of that one-two punch last year for the Dukes. How do you anticipate IU's run game looking? Is it going to be a running back by committee? Can we three all, see all three of these guys? Is one of these guys going to step up? How do you see it shaping out? Yeah, I think in today's game, you really have to have you know, two top tier guys that you're going to rely on on a third guy that can give you some breaks for those top two guys during a game. They have that. I do think they have the depth there. I do think they have the athleticism there uh, there as well. The Ellis kid came over from Wake, was very impressive in the spring game. I like the way he ran it. Uh, Black, also another top-notch type of running back. So I do think their running, their running back room and wide receiver room does have a talented group of kids that they can rely on to a establish an offensive run game, passing game, but also ultimately find ways to get themselves in the end zone and maybe get a couple of big plays along the way, because that's one thing too offensively you got to have is those chunk plays. And I do think they have the talent level to get those type of plays with what they have at running back as well as wide receiver. At tight end, you got Zach Horton coming mm-hmm. over from James Madison. What kind of weapon is he, and how do you see this tight end room being involved in this offense? Well, I think Zach, in, in, in outside of the other two kids in the room um, right now, is a guy that they can utilize as an attached tight end, unattached, spread him out. He's physical enough at the point of attack that he can add his uh, uh, power and necessity in the running game as well and being athletic enough to split out and run against one-on-one against linebackers to create potential mismatches out there he is that type of uh tight end i do think that he adds another dimension when it comes to running a potential no huddle spread offense because you can get into many different sets by just leaving him in which causes the defense to be a little bit more vanilla and uh but i do think he's a young man that uh i have high hopes going into this year because of what i saw of him in the spring you mentioned Bob Bostad before retaining him as the offensive line coach. He was a highly respected name uh, within the Big Ten Conference and all of college football because of what he was able to accomplish, turning out great offensive lines at Wisconsin before. You have three anticipated transfers coming in. You know, uh, Nick Kidwell, Trey Wedde coming over from Wisconsin, uh, Tyler Stevenson from uh, JMU. Uh, you know, all those guys are seniors. How important is it to be able to have guys that have played a lot of uh, – college football and how do you see this offensive line kind of shaping together well with that those three additions uh and kid will also being a jmu kid now some of those kids didn't get in 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 the spring get work in the spring because they were dealing with off-season uh surgeries and such so they'll be added to the mix uh when it comes fall camp but they are definitely a better offensive line than they were a year ago at the same time. Bob Bobstead has done a great job with what he's had to work with. I think he's elevated the offensive line. Even if you watch them last year as they progress through the season, you could see the improvement coming along. Now, it wasn't going to be a big jump where they became an offensive line that just manhandled people. But, you know, Carter Smith, 
the type of player that he is, add the other kids that are there in the system, I do think they've got two solid offensive line units that they can utilize. And and if they do get nicked up and bruised up, I do think they have the depth this year to uh, absorb those. Now, last year when they had some injuries and stuff, it was a big drop-off um, from what they had on the field to what they had backing up. Bob Bobstead has improved that. He solidified it. And I do think that he brings that uh, mentality of they'll find ways to run the football successively. Over on the defensive side of the football, Indiana's defense gave up the most yards per game in the Big Ten uh, last season. But once again, we're talking about flipping this roster. Kurt Sagandy yeah. did a really good job flipping around this roster with around half of this defense's starters expected to be transfers. Do you think that they can make that jump forward with all of this new personnel in tow on the defensive side of the ball? Well, yeah, um, I'm, I'm not going to say it's going to be an easy flip. Um, you've got to have a defensive unit that gels together. Um, I do think after the spring ball, I think if you asked which side of the ball needed tinkering and help was the defense, there was no question about that. And he, Coach Signetti and his staff utilized the spring window to get some good transfers in to help where they needed help at linebacker and uh, in the secondary and up front in the defensive line, they got the CJ West kid from Kent state, which was, I think was a big help for them as well. I've talked about the pounds kid earlier uh, kid that came over from JMU. Um, but I do think they're going to have to be a unit that uh, finds the way to get off the field. And when they have that chance, get off the field. Um, Brian Haynes, the defensive coordinator, young, uh, just like Shanahan is. But the units that he's had at JMU over the last few years have been in the top. I think he had the number one or number two rated uh, uh, defense against the run at JMU. And I say that with a little bit of pride because I was hired. I hired Bryant, as I told you, to his first college job when I was a head yeah. coach at a Division three school. So uh, I'm a little biased because I want. I'm, <laughs> I've watched him grow up to where he's at now. Um, he's making a little bit more money than I paid him, but. Um, <laughs> He does have a good defensive mind. He was a heck of a linebacker at Ball State uh, back in the in the '90s and two, early 2000s. And uh, his mentality as a defensive coordinator is to be aggressive. And I do think he does that very well with the schemes that he has uh, them in and out of. Uh, so I look for that unit to continue to grow and gel as they go through preseason. And we'll find out at, against FIU where they're at and whether or not they're going to have the ability to stand up to some of the tougher talent in and around the Big Ten. There's a lot to be excited about on this defensive line. Uh, mm -hmm. I think Mikhail Kamara comes over from JMU. He tore it up, man. 18 and a half tackles for loss last year, seven and a half sacks, and that wasn't even you know tops on the team. They had a lot of players that could get into the backfield and wreak havoc. Uh, James Carpenter also comes over from JMU. Nine TFLs and four sacks. They grab CJ West, who you talked about. Wisconsin was hot after him at the defensive tackle, but he ends up in Bloomington, Indiana. Linnell Carr returns after racking up five sacks last season do you anticipate this Hoosier defense they can wreak havoc a similar amount of havoc like they were able to do at James Madison I do um I do think their front six is a uh, front seven is a, a pretty good solid unit of what they've been able to bring in upon of what they already had um like I said, they're an aggressive defense. They're going to be a defense that wants to get after an offense they're not type of defense that say sit back and you know play it play it uh play the odds so to speak um everything about them is utilizing their athletic ability to put pressure on an offense however that works now that doesn't mean they're going to skip out full out scale blitz all the time but you're gonna have times where their corners are going to be in man-to-man -man scenarios on the outside so they're going to have to do a good job on the 50 50 balls and then ultimately turnovers is going to be the ultimate deciding factor defensively for them because that's what they got to do uh once they get into big 10 play is find ways to get turnovers and at jmu they did a pretty good job at that when we were first talking at the beginning of this preview 
you mentioned D'Angelo Pons, right? And that's where I want to go to next, the secondary, because you look at him last season, 13 pass breakups led James Madison. When you look at pro football focus type of rankings, he's one of the top defensive backs right now graded uh, within the Big Ten Conference last year. Sean Asbury and T- uh, Terry Jones coming over from the state of Virginia, just uh, from mm-hmm. Old Dominion. Are you confident this unit can improve an IU pass defense that struggled in the Big Ten last year? Uh, yeah, I do. Now, Again, with what they do off uh, defensively with their aggressiveness, uh, they've got to find ways to be very good in the man-to-man schemes that they want to run. Now, they have to have corners to do that. I do believe they have that, Pounds being one of them, that they can go ahead and lock up a guy on the outside with him and take one of the 11 uh, offensive players out of the scope of the offense. So it's all going to depend on, again, staying healthy, especially on the outside, and how much they can win those 50-50 balls on the outside. Indiana last year gave up way too many big chunk plays that we Mm -hmm. talked about earlier on what an offense needs to do. Defensively, they cannot give up the number of big plays that Indiana was giving up last year. That was one of their, I guess you could say, weak points of a defense is that they were getting hit with a lot of big chunk plays at time at critical moments in a ball game. And that's the one thing that this defense is going to have to find ways to do better than last year. Everybody talks about generating pressure on the quarterback. I think maybe not a lot of people, what happens on the back end in that situation, when you talk about that man coverage, you got to stick to those guys like glue. We'll see if Indiana can do that. It looks like they may. Let's head over to the linebacker position. Broken record once again, it's James Madison West. Two leading tacklers from JMU are coming over to IU. You look at Aiden Fisher, 108 tackles last year. Jalen Walker had 61 tackles uh, last year. How do you shoot? How do you see this room making a difference in the middle of this defense? I like the Aiden Fisher kid. I think he's a leader from the time that he stepped on Indiana's campus. I like the way he handles himself on and off the field. And when he does step in, into the interview room and gets behind the mic, he's a very well-spoken kid. I do think he'll provide a great amount of leadership on defense. I do believe their inside linebacking core as a group outside of just those two kid is, kids are pretty strong. And what they've been able to add uh, to that unit has only made them stronger since one they got from the transfer portal. So I do believe that their front seven as a collective group is much better than it was a year or the spring, as well as compared to where they were a year ago. So overall, I think linebacking group is one of their key uh, things on defense with what they've got from a leadership component. Improved offense. Improved defense, a coaching staff that has brought in a lot of energy. It could be the ingredients of Indiana being that surprise team of the Big Ten. Now, in order to be that surprise team, you got to win some football games. Let's take a look at this schedule um, right now. We talk about the roster, and we talk about everything coming together, but they have a favorable schedule early yeah. on in this season. How important is it getting off to that hot start to be able to get back to bowl eligibility? Well, we talked about it a little bit before we came on air. There's there, there is a distinctive possibility that this team could go into their game against Nebraska as a six and O team. Yep. Is at worst, I believe, a four and two team. Now, in order to do that, they're going to have to beat the lights of UCLA and Maryland. Those are the games that Indiana in the past has played close. They played tough, but they've yep. found ways to lose those type of games. They've got to find ways to win those games. And again, starting off against FIU and Western Illinois, um, those are two good. You know, I call them scrimmages in today's world of right. the out there. And before they go on their Big Ten uh, opener on the road in Pasadena, that will be a big challenge in itself. You're talking going about two different time zones, but also going into one of the most prominent uh, stadiums in the country in Pasadena in the Rose Bowl against a team as well that is having a first-year head coach in UCLA. But those are the type of games that they're going to have to find ways to win against US, you know, UCLA, Uh, Maryland, the Northwesterns of the world, because if they can find ways to get those three wins and take care of what they need to do versus their, uh, you know, the non-conference opponents, they have a bye week before they play Nebraska. So they could essentially go into the bye week uh, with an undefeated record. 
and having two weeks to prepare for a Nebraska team that's going to be a stellar Nebraska team. Matt Rule is a good football coach. He's done some good things in what they are. That will be the huge test for Indiana, only if they can come into that game with a winning record up through that point in time, whether it's undefeated, whether it's a one loss or two loss, that's going to be the key component heading into that second half of the schedule, which gets a little bit more challenging when you talk about the Big Ten. Yeah, that UCLA game is very interesting to me uh, because those are two teams, first-year head coaches that you mentioned. Those are big games. It could come down for both Indiana and UCLA. That could maybe be a game that determines bowl eligibility. I mm-hmm. want to ask you one a simple question to kind of finish things off here. What is considered success for the Hoosiers in 2024? <laughs> you know um... – You you can look at it the one way where you say the black and white of the matter, and that's the overall wins and losses. Uh, I do believe that uh, this is a team that can definitely be a bowl type of team, eligibility type of team. And I wouldn't be shocked if they are a, you know, a seven and five or even an eight and four type of team. Um, That wouldn't surprise me. Um, But they're only two losses away from being that mediocre average six and six team. Well, six and six for most people in a bowl bid is great at Indiana. Kurt Signetti will not accept six and six and just having the uh, extension of a bowl that's, you know, here's your victory trophy because you're six and six. Here's a man that wants to be a contender in the Big Ten. He will not accept mediocrity. He's a fast, physical, and relentless type of guy with a blueprint. So overall, I don't think anything better than a 7-5, and 8-4 and four for him is going to do it. Um, but if I look at it realistic, 7-5 and five is probably a good landing spot for this team right now, making the crystal ball do the work for you. Absolutely. And Kurt Signetti has injected that optimism saying, Purdue sucks, but so does Michigan and Ohio State. He goes on the Big Ten Network sets that we're going to be playing in Indianapolis here uh, pretty soon. Shannon Griffith from the Hoosier tailgate as a part of the Believe in Network. Always great to talk some Indiana Hoosier football, and I'm sure we'll see you down the road. Absolutely, anytime. Thanks for watching Big Ten Ted, where it's all Big Ten all year long. Make sure to like the video to spread the word of Big Ten Ted to the masses and subscribe to the channel for updates on Big Ten content that drops every day.